Hey guys, Mark Holthy here, Canadian immigration lawyer, back again for another Canadian live immigration Q&A. And uh, today, like any other day, we've got a lot of really cool things to announce, lots of things to talk about, and I have another special guest who I'll get to in a little bit. If you watched last week's guest, um, well, it was actually last Tuesday's guest in our live um, Alvaro came on to talk about his journey and the challenges he had becoming a permanent resident. And uh, this week, or this episode today, Thursday, um, I've got someone that you guys have not yet been introduced to, but I'm going to leave you hanging. And she is going to talk about what it's been like trying to land and become a permanent resident and really settle uh, in the midst of this pandemic and what it's been like. So. I'm going to leave you hanging and we'll bring her on in just a little bit. So let's see who's tuning in here. We'll give people a little bit more time to connect. We've got Muhammad. Make sure you always list where you're listening uh, from. And uh, we love to see where everybody's at. So we've got some faithfuls that are always here, always watching. And I'm so grateful for all of you. Understand that it's 1 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time in Canada right now. And for many people that are watching, for example, Karen here in Delhi, it's it's like 1.30 a.m. So you guys that are all over the world who are watching this from different locations, it really means a lot that you'd be willing to stay up so late to be a part of this. So very, very cool and thank you. Uh, Amit we've got here. Uh, Payal, another. Hello, Mark from India. Welcome. Um, Shail, we've got here. Uh, Sabia has got, is from Islamabad. Um, let's see. Oh yeah. Everybody's starting to pile in now. And it's really good, uh, to see that we have both Facebook and we have YouTube coming in fine. And those of you who are tuning in from Twitter, fantastic as well. And I have to give a shout out to Darshan slice, uh, slash, um, uh, <laughs> Tom Cruise. Very, very cool. <laughs> very cool. Um, Eileen's here in Canada. Welcome. It's good to have you. Let's see who else we've got here. Uh, I love Mix Master Mentor. <laughs> Glad to see you again too. Some of you have obviously got your own YouTube channels, which is very cool. Rami over in Egypt. One day I'm going to get there, Rami. One day I am going to get there. Uh, for Zana's over in Bangladesh. We've got Shashnik who's tuning in from Toronto. Destiny is also over in East Toronto. Welcome. And <laughs> Emeka says the topic will be most useful to me. Yes, Mashi, 100% it will. However, <laughs> one of the things I am going to point out is that for those who are in the U.S., you actually have a little bit of a leg up. So, But I'll show you where you can go, Emeka, and I'll show you where to look because that's what I do. I provide the information not just for me but the source in which I got it from. So I'll be sharing that with you guys. Another person over in Ontario, over in Barrie, Welcome. Wow, we've got great a, we've got a great Canadian contingent. We've got Vancouver. Uh, let's see where else we've got here. Oh, excellent. Alejandro, we've got you from Bolivia. Very cool. South America representation. Uh, we've got Boshangs down in San Francisco. I hope you're staying safe, my friend. I know how crazy things are down in the US. All right, well, that's enough shout outs for now. Um, you can see today we've got a little bit of an interesting topic. It's a little bit more specific. I'm definitely going to get to your questions. So don't worry about that. I will absolutely get to listener questions. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the changes that immigration has recently introduced to allow some, and I'm going to qualify it, and this is for you, Mashi, to allow some PRs, depending upon your jurisdiction, um, to come and actually land even on an expired passport, um, uh, your visa and confirmation of permanent residence. So I'll keep, uh, I'll let you guys know about that in just a little bit. And we've got a bunch of other people that are also joining in. So hello, Shiraz, great to have you. We've got Paul over in Kuwait, Jim over in Nigeria, and uh, <laughs> Diana says, how are you enjoying the heat? I'm loving it. I'm actually loving it. And we'll finish off with Nagaraju, who's tuning in from India as well. So welcome, all of you. Now, let's jump to our special guest today. Once we've talked with our special guest, then we'll jump back and we'll talk about these new developments 
and uh, and we'll just we'll read it together. We'll go through it together because it was just announced, I think, yesterday. And so we're going to talk about some of the changes that Canada is making to try to facilitate the entry of, of people that already have their confirmations of permanent residence. Okay. The, all right. The moment is here. Welcome, Tatiana. How are you? Hello. Hi, Mark. It's nice to hear you. Great. Well, I'm super, super grateful that you were willing to join me. Now, Tatiana, tell me, what is your connection to Holthy Immigration Law? So, oh. so, so why are you joining me today and who put you up to this? Because Mark Holsey is the best. <laughs> <laughs> we had an issue before in the United States. We had a hard situation with immigration to Canada. And actually, we're so happy that we chose Mark. He just saved our life. So that's how we get to the Canada. And it was super, super hard, but he made it. And it was just exactly before COVID. It was exactly like week or two weeks before the COVID. So it was very, very hard actually, but we're so, so happy. Now you're mentioning we, Tatiana. Right. So who is the other person My husband, that you're Igor. referring to? Who's your husband? Igor. Igor. Okay, Igor, you have to stick your head in. I know you're there. Hi, everyone. There we go. You can see me. So, so those of you who connect with the firm, you you're often... Uh, interacting with Igor, and we thought we would bring Tatiana on because she's had a different perspective to Igor. So Igor, um, when, having worked with him and him being a client, I realized right away that I wanted him to join the firm. And I've had other people that have joined the firm because of that too. But Tatiana is in a different situation, and she had to go out and find her own job. And so I wanted to talk to Tatiana, and thanks, that's good, Igor. Thanks so much. Um, I wanted to talk to Tatiana about some of the challenges that people, because obviously the, the permanent residents that are coming to Canada now are wondering, can I find a job? Is there going to be uh, you know, an ability for me to establish myself in, in this whole pandemic? So, <coughs> excuse me. So Tatiana, tell us a little bit about how hard it was for you to find a job and, and kind of what you're doing now. All right. So I think during the pandemic, it, it was very hard to find a job because a lot of people, they were fired uh, because of the COVID, but it's still, they still needed people. They still needed like a session, uh, essential workers. They still needed like nurse or some, uh, some stuff like that. So if you really want, you can find a job actually, but it shouldn't be something like very good as you expect that. So it's, pretty much should be like uh, some work in a store or any other places which you can help people to survive, <coughs> we may say. So it took me like three months, I think, to find a job. It's a store. It's like very nice people, especially what I want to say that to work with Canadians, it's awesome because uh, what I remarked for myself that they have a balance between work and life. And everyone at your job will appreciate that. They're not going to press you, push you or something else. They, they will ask you. They will talk to you. So this is a very good and healthy environment, actually. So very that's cool. what I want to say. So if you guys want to move to Canada, do that. <laughs> awesome. And so, I, yeah. so what did you physically do? Like, what are the kind of things, what made, what, what, what allowed you to be successful in getting that job? You obviously had to submit a lot of, applications and things like that but but what did you do to to try to find places to hire because lots of people are curious about the steps that you take to try to find that job did you did you did you call people did you send in applications like how did you and you're working with home depot right right yeah so how did you ultimately get that job uh, I think you have to have an experience. Maybe they're not looking at experience. They're looking for the person who is friendly. So the first, what you have to do, it's like uh, create your resume and just try to send it everywhere where you like uh, want to go. And when they invite you to the 
um, interview, I think the most thing which is important how friendly you are to people. So they, they're not only looking for the person who has an experience or something else, they're looking for the person who will be friendly, like um, appreciate uh, and other people, you know. So they're looking someone who will fit in their environment very good. So actually, this is the point. So be friendly, be nice to people, and everything will come back to you. And also uh, make your resume. This is the number one what you have to do. Even if you you're, you got your PR already, uh, like I'm an immigration visa, you still have a time before you move to Canada. Just do that. This is the first step what you have to do. And it's a lot of samples and internet. So this is the best way how to do that actually. And I also, how I got his job, I just met a guy, he's my friend, he's Brazilian. It was actually accidentally, he just gave me the fit, like feedback, we may say, he just gave me the recommendation. So that's how I actually get it because some people, yeah, they just, they just sometimes um, looking for the people who was referred by someone who was working at this place. So this is also a nice thing. So if you have a friend or you know someone, you can just ask them about your referral and it's like much faster than you will search for that by yourself. So that's what I Excellent. think also. Thank you so much for pointing that out because one thing I want to remind everyone, in Canada, the best way of getting a job is through someone that knows you. And that referral that Tatiana is talking about is, is super important. Um, yes, you can get a job just by submitting an application and Tatiana had to do that when she was applying to Home Depot. But the reality is, in many cases, you can really short circuit that process or make it faster by building your friendship circle, talking to people, getting to know people. Don't just stay in your home, you know, and obviously in, in this world of the pandemic, we are restricted to what we can do and how much we can go out and socialize. And that's a reality. But, but generally speaking, you want to try to meet people. You want to expand your network of, of, of contacts because someone you meet may know about a job and they may know the people that are hiring and that personal referral is really, really important. So... Yeah, just one thing I want to say. So if you like sport person or you like any activities, it's a lot of stuff to do in Canada. Actually, people, they just love sport here. It depends also what kind of city will you choose. But in a Calgary, because I'm living in a Calgary, they're very, very good in it. So you can go to running club. You can go to climbing club. You can do hiking. You can meet people. Just be more open. I know that it's very hard with like different mentality. If you're not Canadian, you didn't born here to just be like very open, but try to do that and you will see how people will like it, love it and appreciate it. That's how you can actually meet people. That's what exactly. I think. Exactly. Now you can see Sunel here. He said, Tatiana, with which program you moved to Canada? Oh, and it was uh, Federal Skilled Workers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Country law. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. So um, if you do have a question for Tatiana, don't hesitate to post it and we'll pull We'll pull your question on here. Um, if you had, if you had to say, what was one thing that was the most difficult part of of coming to Canada and getting settled? What would you, what would you say that would be the most difficult part for you personally? For me, it was like to searching for the apartments because you don't know the city very well and you want to find some the good place to live. So it's a hard part because you need to have a job. If you didn't have like job offer, they may just like, you know, deny you or something else. So this is what you have to be prepared that you, when you arrive into Canada, you have to like rent some like um, Airbnb maybe for a few weeks and to take this time to just search for the apartments, you know. So this, this was the hardest part, but everything else, I think if you like hard worker and if you have any ambition for a life, you probably will do everything and you yep. will achieve everything what you want. Because in this country, people like people who like to work and develop yourself. So that's what I think. Mm -hmm. Very cool. And you can see Arthur here. He says, if you have the better attitude, it will make a big difference more than experiences. Exactly. And I think... I think absolutely experience plays it. You can't ignore that experience is important, but absolutely, you know, having that right attitude, being positive, uh, being willing to learn. Um, absolutely. Those are, those are some of the things that play a huge role in being able to get a job in Canada. 
All right. Well, that's great. Well, Tatiana, thank you for joining us. Um, that was great to have you come on board. And for those who are wondering, who is this Tatiana? Well, Tatiana is, is uh, um, her husband is Igor, and he works within Whole the Immigration Law. And uh, they recently immigrated uh, just earlier this year, right before the pandemic to Canada. And uh, so I thought I'd bring Tatiana on because Igor, he had a job offer for him before he even set foot in Canada. But Tatiana had to work hard to get her job. And you can see she's super personable, just really kind and friendly. And it's easy to see how it, uh, it was easy for, for Home Depot to hire her. And I know that that's just one little stepping stone, right, Tatiana? You don't expect to be working at Home Depot for the rest of your life, right? Exactly. You've got, you've got bigger plans. And what kinds of things are you hoping to do? Actually, uh, I love sport and uh, I would love to help people to get better and I would love to work with kids. So I was thinking maybe to work in a YMCA in the future because it's very like healthy and nice environment. That's what I wanted to do. Like, you know, find some place when uh, which job I will like, actually, and I will do something good for people. So I think YMCA is the better way for me. That's my yeah. goal, actually. Very cool. I think that's awesome. And I think that's what you do. You realize, you know, and, and I'll give Amin a shout out here. He says, thanks, Tatiana, for this noble testimony. And I love Amin because he connects in through uh, through Twitter. So but but yeah, the you know, the reality is sometimes you have to when you first come to Canada, take a job that normally you wouldn't want to work in forever to kind of get your foot in the door and to get some experience. And and then you can transition to other opportunities as they unfold. And that's no different for anyone who enters the Canadian labor market for the first time. I look at my children who are, uh, you know, their first jobs in, in the, um, you know, in the labor market. It's not easy to do that. And so even for them, they rely on word of mouth. They have to start in food service or something like that, get experience and then transition. And, uh, you know, I had a brother who worked at Home Depot here in Canada as well, Tatiana, down in Lethbridge here where I live. And so, um, you know, and now he's a dentist. And so it just... Sometimes you all you always have to um, make certain sacrifices yeah. to pave the way for other opportunities. Right, agree hundred percent. You have to start with something, and you will meet a lot of very nice and good people, like customers. So you can meet someone who can offer you a job. Also, I heard yeah. a lot of situation about that. So the girl, she's working in a Home Depot. She's a student in Canada, and she met a guy who just offered her a job, and it's actually a very good job. It's like manager in an Uber. I think for the beginning, it's very good. Yes, absolutely. One one job can lead to another to another. Yeah. So. And that's the cool thing about Canada. You know, everybody has an opportunity. You're not, you're not forced to just only work in a certain job because of your class or your, the caste system in your country. It's open. Canada has, is an equal opportunity employer. And obviously there are challenges. You know, you have to be able to speak English and lots of, you right. know, lots of people who are immigrating now realize that English is really important. And, yeah. and, um, and so you've had to work at that, Tatiana, as well. And your English is is really really good you've done you've done so well <laughs> yeah very cool well thank you tatiana we'll let you go and uh we'll, we'll just yeah i appreciate you coming on and joining hey, thank you mark have a nice day guys bye bye <laughs> awesome all right well that was great it was awesome to have tatiana join and to be a part of this and uh we'll say goodbye here and and uh, we'll now shift over to our main question here that I know Mashi and a bunch of others have been waiting for, and that is these new changes and developments that are happening with respect to a uh, permanent residence. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen with you guys so you can see this. We'll see if this is going to work. Yes, it will. I'm going to enlarge this to make it easier for people to see. And we're going to spend a little bit of time just talking about this. Um, and so we'll enlarge that just a little bit. So what you'll see here, this link, and Igor can post it in the, um, uh, in, on YouTube and on Facebook. You can also just search for this on the IRCC website right here. But permanent residence, COVID-19 program delivery. So these are the program delivery instructions that the officers follow. And this is where I go. Because if the officers are following these instructions, then I know I'm safe to advise my clients regarding this. And so there's some generic information which everybody knows. And one of the things is that if you're in the process of submitting your application and you're unable to get, you can see here on an unavailable documents, immigration, they will give you time to upload those 
um, if your application is not perfected or not 100% complete. And, um, and so they will give uh, an opportunity for people, if you don't have a document because of COVID, to go ahead and uh, submit your application and then update it later when you have it. Now, here's one thing that I want to point out before I get to the actual travel stuff. Applications found to be incomplete with no explanation provided or for reasons unrelated to the disruption of service associated with impacts of the novel coronavirus may be rejected in the same way. And so if you do not provide an explanation that relates back to disruptions caused by COVID-19, then they can refuse your application. So don't just assume that when you're filing, you if you don't have your police certificate because your country isn't issuing it to you, that you don't need to explain that. Immigration just knows and understands. Uh-uh. They will and do refu refuse your application as being incomplete. So it's important that, um, uh, you know, that when you are submitting your application, if you don't have everything, make sure that you provide that right there, an explanation. Okay, now let's take a look what's happened. So approved permanent resident applications with a COPR and PRV issued to clients outside Canada. So this policy applies to permanent residents like you who are outside of Canada um, that already have your confirmation of permanent residence and a permanent resident visa. So they've broken this down into a number of groups. And so very, pay very close attention to this because each group is going to have different rules applied to them. And to start with, this is for people traveling from any country other than the US. That's group one. These people had their COPRs and PRVs, that's the permanent resident visa, issued on or before March 18th, 2020, they've always been able to travel. So they've never been restricted, but they're just reiterating it. So they're exempt from the travel restrictions. They can travel, but remember, once again, it says for non-discretionary reasons. That means if you're looking at doing a, a soft landing, they're not going to let you. At least the border officers are going to ask a lot of questions and probably are going to make it difficult for you if you intend to only do a soft landing. And you must have your settle, your quarantine plan in place. So the most important part um, uh, for, for these individuals here um, is, is really when that COPR and that PR visa was issued. And remember, these are for people whose, whose COPRs are still valid, okay? So you've always been able to travel. Then we have traveling from the U.S. Group 2. So the first one is any other country and, and Group 2 is in the U.S., so, and remember, these are also valid COPRs. So they're still valid for you, okay? So when we're going through the U.S. in group two, applicants can travel to Canada from the U.S. for non-discretionary reasons to settle. If their application was approved, they received their COPR and they're both valid. And once again, the quarantine plan is in place. Now, what does that mean about the quarantine plan? You have to show that when you come, you're actually going to go directly to your home or wherever you're going to stay, if it's a, a, an Airbnb, whatever it is, and you're and you're going to isolate there until the whole 14-day period has passed. And you're not going to go and spend time going all over the place. You're going to stay there. That's one of the most important parts of the plan. Now, there's more involved in it. And at times, there are even exemptions to the quarantine plans. But for most people, you have to be prepared and show how you've got that all set up. And sometimes, I'll be honest, it's difficult if you don't have already have someone in Canada that can get you your food and get your shelves stocked and allow you to be able to actually isolate there. So that's one of the factors the officers look at. But for Mashi and for a lot of you other folks out there, the key here that we're looking at right now is what do you do when you have an expired COPR and PR visa? You'll remember that I've told you many times in the past that if your COPR is getting ready to expire, you must have submitted a web form notifying them that your COPR is expiring and that you did want to still travel to Canada, but were prevented from doing so because of COVID-19 and the travel restrictions. So you people here with expired COPRs, if you have not notified IRCC, well, boy, you're in a whole heap of problems and you better make sure immediately that you notify them and say you weren't aware, you couldn't travel, but please keep my, my confirmation of permanent residence and my intention to become a permanent resident 
uh, keep it alive. Don't cancel my application. Don't you know allow me to still travel. So you want to make sure you take steps immediately if you haven't done it. But best practice, you notify them before your COPR expires. All right. But for those who have done that and are now in a situation like Mashi, traveling from any country other than the U.S., Mashi, this is you. Okay. So you can see here if the COPR and the PR visa were issued on or before March 18th, but are are now expired, the applicant is exempt from the travel restrictions, can travel to Canada for the same reasons that we talked about and must have an acceptable plan to quarantine. So Mashi, if your COPR was issued after March 18th, 2020, then you're not able to travel. And the reality is in many cases, there's gonna be very few people that actually have um, uh, COPRs that have, were, were issued after March 18th. There are some, but most people, there's, they're just being held in abeyance. They're actually not, uh, those COPRs haven't been issued to you because of the travel restrictions. Mashi, I seem to believe that yours was in fact issued before March 18th, 2020, but that's the key here. So if they've expired after that date, you're exempt from the travel restrictions and you can actually travel to Canada. You can travel to Canada for non-discretionary reasons, like I said, which is means I'm actually permanently moving. I'm not going to do a soft landing. I've got my, my residence set up. I'm ready to go. Okay. And so you can say in order to settle and live in Canada as permanent residence and then get that quarantine plan in place. And Mashi, I recommend that you reach out to the office and uh, Susan in our office, who uh, Susan Wood, has become my expert on the travel restrictions and the quarantine plans. And she helps all of our clients with that. And next Tuesday, I'm going to have Susan join me and we're going to talk about this in a lot more detail. But I wanted to, to just isolate this and identify it for people right now because it was just released. So applicants must check the issue date in the application details section of their COPR to see if this applies to them. And that's really what it comes down to is March 18th, 2020. Okay. So now let's look at the group four, which is traveling from the U S. So these are people that are in the U S and let's see what it has to say here. So if you're traveling with an expired COPR, so applicants with an expired COPR can travel to Canada from the U S for non-discretionary reasons to settle if, and once again, you can see here their application was approved. So what's the difference between people in the U S and people in any country other than the U S only people that have had their COPRs issued before March 18th, 2020 are able to travel on an expired COPR and PRV. In the U.S. though, they could have had their COPR issued even recently. Now, obviously, it wouldn't be <laughs> recently if it was already expired, but there isn't that March 18th date that it was issued. It could have been issued after that, but the medical, medical requirements resulted in the COPR um, being expiring sooner. And so um, you received your COPR and PRV and you have that quarantine plan in place. And once again, this is something that our office does for a lot of our clients. And if you are wondering what you need to do, we've got a special plan that we've set up with Susan to help people make sure that they have and know what their obligations are. Because if this quarantine isn't in place, then you could be turned back by the officer at the border. And imagine if you're in the U.S. and you know if you leave, you can't get back in, but you travel from the U.S. to Canada and then you're stuck at the airport and they won't let you in because you don't have a satisfactory, a satisfactory quarantine plan, then you are in a whole, hope, a whole host of problems. So I recommend that you reach out and book a consult with us. And I've showed this many times before. All you have to go is to our healthylaw.com website. And once you're there, click on start here and you can set up your consult right here. And, um, and so that's where I recommend people who are uncertain what this means or what they have to do. Book a consult. We can work, that, work, that, uh, work through that with you. And I'll make sure Susan Wood, um, who is uh, one of the immigration lawyers that practices in our Edmonton region, Edmonton, Alberta, she is exceptional at this stuff. Okay. Now you can see here only permanent resident applicants who are in possession of an expired COPR and PRV and who are ready to travel to Canada should contact IRCC using the web form to provide information on when the COPR expired and the non-discretionary reason for travel. So when you're going through this process, 
you as a COPR holder who want to travel on an expired um, COPR, you still need to reach out to immigration via the web form. And this becomes a little bit complicated because on the surface, it doesn't look like that applies to these other things. It, it almost looks like it only applies to group four. But the way we've been interpreting this is that everybody who's eligible to travel now on an expired needs to reach out via web form and explain the non-discretionary reason for traveling. And ultimately for most PRs, you know, you're going to, there, there's some steps that you can take to show that you're not going to be doing a soft landing, that you have things set up, you have a, a plan in place for you to establish in Canada. Once the web forms are received, the client support center will refer them to the appropriate processing network, which will assess them based on the eligibility criteria below. And you can see here is the eligibility criteria. So the applicants can come to Canada and become a permanent resident now if they plan to stay and settle. If they're planning on coming temporarily and leaving again, they can't do that right now unless they're exempt from the restrictions. So that is the key, no soft landings. You must show, and this is where it is, proof of an acceptable plan to settle. And they give some indication of what's needed to be included in here. You can see here, um, address, lease agreement, home ownership document. You need to show that you've got a place to live. Employment plans. Do you have the location of work? Do you have a letter from an employer or any other relevant information? So even though this on the surface looks like it's really easy and you can, if you meet the requirements, away you go, it's not that easy. So the plan, this, this, um, this uh, uh, notification that people can travel on expired COPRs is a wonderful development, but there are still significant restrictions in place related to demonstrating that you're not traveling for a, you know, for an optional purpose. Okay. And then proof of an acceptable plan. That's why we as a, uh, as a firm are offering this specifically to you out there that are COPRs looking to travel now, we can walk you through this. We can help you with this. So you can see proof of funds. Well, all of you have to provide that anyways. Um, and how you will access groceries, medical care, and other essential services. Understand this is the issue. If you come in and you plan on just going to the grocery store and buying your groceries, this can cause your plan to fail. And so you need to have a plan in place for someone to be able to assist with that. And you can see here, while in quarantine, they will not be able to leave their place of quarantine for any reason. And this is mandatory, even if they have no COVID-19 symptoms. So you can see that's another portion. And then wrapping it up, travel itinerary, okay? Your tickets that you've already purchased them. And, um, and then all the additional family also must be able to meet these same requirements. So I'm not going to go into any more detail with this. But that's essentially what's happened. Um, you, can, you can search for this permanent residence, COVID-19, program delivery, IRCC, PDI, whatever you want to add in there. Um, but essentially, this is the new rules. And when did this come out? If we scroll down to the bottom, you'll see July 29th, which was yesterday. All right. Whew, that was a lot to go through, but it was important because that's the big, big development that has happened. And I want you guys to see the source of it. And I want you to bookmark this. You know, you can rely on me talking. You can rely on me sharing this information to you. But the reality is government could change this information tomorrow. So although I'm doing this live July 30th, it's entirely possible that the government comes out and pulls this and changes it. You know, there's going to be new changes. The orders in council for, for non-US um, travel restrictions, those are going to be expiring here so shortly. And so that's why I'm bringing Susan on on Tuesday to talk about any changes that may have arisen with the new um, with the new orders in council and the new uh, travel restrictions that are either modified or going to be announced. All right. Whew, that was a lot. That was a lot. Thank you so much, everybody, for being patient with that. And, uh, you know, the reality is with everything that we have going on right now, um, it's it's the information that I'm sharing today you know, it could be outdated tomorrow by the time people are watching this as a recording. So those who are watching this live understand it's um, this is right off the press, hot off the press. OK, let's take a look here at some more questions and uh, let's see. Oh, we've got a ton of people 
that are, are now posting. So let's go back and see what we can do to get some of these questions answered. Um, <laughs> ah, Heather, that's awesome. She says, Heather, uh, your cousin Wendy says you are the best. <laughs> are they processing visitor visas? Okay, no, they're not. Well, let me stand corrected. Yes, visitor visas are being processed. You can apply, but the travel restrictions on non-optional, non-discretionary still apply, Heather. And so if you are, even if you've submitted your, um, your TRV application, your temporary resident visa application, the travel restrictions are still layered on top of that and it can prevent someone from traveling. So you'll see that there has not been a lot of um, TRVs actually issued. Uh, let's leave aside the fact that the visa offices abroad are still operating with a skeleton crew. They, they don't have their full complement of officers and there still has to be someone to accept the passport, put the visa in the passport and send it back. And that's what's lacking. So they are accepting applications. They're processing them electronically but biometrics and those areas are all things that can trip up and, and slow down that process. So please say hi to Wendy. She told me just yesterday uh, all that she's doing and that she's planning on taking the immigration consultant course. And, uh, and despite what I tell you guys, okay, in spite of how, and every time I post, there's always two or three or four thumbs down, which are people, probably consultants, because I'm slagging consultants, and I'm not going to change my tune on that. There are a freaking massive number of absolutely terrible consultants out there that are taking people's money and ruining their lives that care nothing more than to, to just steal people's money and, and not provide any valued service. Okay. That's my position. And I'm never moving from that because 30% of my consults every day are people that have used another consultant and then come to me for a second opinion or to try to fix something that's been destroyed. So I'll never apologize for that. But I will reiterate that there are some excellent immigration consultants out there that are fully qualified, that care about their clients, that truly spend the time and are smart and intelligent, that read the law, that understand it, that do everything's necessary to, to really help people. So there are definitely consultants out there like that. And my, my cousin Wendy is super smart, super exceptional. She works in the schools, actually. And her school has recently received um, uh, accreditation to allow them to run another semester of, of uh, immigration, um, the immigration and practitioner course. Now, it's all going to come to an end after this. And Wendy, I think, is, is planning on taking that course so that she can be in the school and advise students that come. And I fully support that because... Lots of schools do not provide sufficient help and support to the international students that come. They come, they take their tuition money, they enroll them, and then they leave them to their own devices. But having someone that is actually certified um, to provide immigration advice, uh, I fully support Wendy in doing that. So it's a little bit more than I intended to get into, and it seems like I always address this issue. But those of you consultants who are like, quit slamming consultants, will freaking deal with the crappy ones that are out there actually um, set up a system in place that punishes them because right now what's in place is garbage. There's no mechanism to protect the public. It is very, very weak. And yes, you've got a new college that you're creating. Yes, there's new systems being in place. Well, get on with it. Then just do it because right now all that's happening is there's hundreds and thousands literally of new immigration consultants coming into the queue who are not prepared to actually help people. And with the new education standards that the college is putting out there, I'm in full support of those education standards. And it was really, really challenging for me um, uh, to, to, um, you know, to accept the fact that Queen's Law is now offering this program, but the reality, or it will in, in the spring, but I think what they're doing is actually good. And if it can increase the standard that consultants have to meet to represent people and actually hold the lives of their, of their clients in, in the balance, then I'm 100% behind it. You know, and um, I've just been so disillusioned and so disappointed with what's happened to this stage. And the only thing that the, the consultant organization has been really good at is adding new members to their mix. And um, so I'll leave it at that. Okay, boy, I did not intend to do that, but uh, <laughs> but sometimes I get pulled into it. Okay, uh, okay, we've got another question here. Giri says, visitor visas opened yet or still closed from India? They're accepting applications, but we're not seeing any approved at this stage. 
Okay. Um, let's see here. We're scrolling down to get some more questions. Okay. Um, uh, this is very important, Masi. You can always go back and watch this as a recording on the same YouTube channel. Subscribe. All of you that are watching this, make sure that you subscribe. You will get notifications when these videos go live on YouTube as well as you can always go back and watch them. They're all there. That's why I love YouTube. That's why I love it so much more than Facebook. And Facebook was really good to me in the early days, but it's really sucked of late. And so that's why I post to everything. All right. So yes, you can watch this as a, um, you can definitely watch this as a recording. Okay. Um, okay. Here's a good question. Rami, Rami says, hey, does this give any indication that IRCC might resume FSW draws? I honestly believe the next, next draw is going to be FSW. And it wouldn't surprise me at all if, um, I'll turn off my notifications here. It wouldn't surprise me at all if we had um, FSW draw, then a CEC draw. But remember, we still need a federal skilled trade draw before this year is out. And I honestly believe that immigration is going to have one of those draws shortly here as well. Okay, let's see here. Um, Facebook says you have to attempt NCA exams to become a lawyer in Canada. Yes, that's right. And ironically, that's exactly what Igor is doing. So Igor is um, he has his master's in law and he is coming and he's going to go through the process, take the NCA exams and uh, and do whatever it takes for him to become a lawyer. And I'm going to support him in that. So that's one of the, uh, the the one of the key reasons why I agreed to hire Igor to come join is because I fully intend for him to go through the process and to support him fully to become a Canadian lawyer. All right. <laughs> Ravi says you just earned a new fan. Thank you. I appreciate that, my friend. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So um, Diana says, hey, do you suggest submitting an ROE to support work experience verification? Um, well, anything that, that can add to and confirm something that might be missing from your letter, I include it. Um, in Canada, work experience um, they indicate to to include uh, um, your um, include a copy of your your uh, your T4 and your confirmation of employment. So an ROE, absolutely, you can include it. It proves to the government, well, that th this is an official government document that confirms you work there. So yeah, if you've got it, there's no harm in including it at all. Um, okay, let's see what else we have here as we're scrolling through here. Okay. <laughs> Starbucks says, thanks for the updates. You're very welcome. Um, okay. Have you experienced with self-employed applications? If not, can you refer me? Thanks. Eaton, self-employed. What does that mean? <laughs> self-employed applications can be self-employed permanent resident applications that are only limited to those who are in the arts or athletics. Um, self-employed um, are individuals that have foreign work experience that's self-employed that they're trying to prove for the purposes of express entry. Other people in a way are kind of like entrepreneurs and you have to go back to my Canadian immigration podcast. Let's see if I can type it in here. Immigration podcast. And I'm going to flip my screen over here so you guys can see this. It's a little bit small, but you can figure it out. This here, you guys have got to go check this out. And I've started to ramp these up again because I love bringing on other lawyers to talk about the intricacies of immigration. And I've got a special series on hearings and, appe and appeals. Um, I've got another episode that's going to be released as well from Reka here on August the 1st. But I've got a ton of information. Everything from, you can see here, how Trump's new restrictions. And all you have to do is go to Canadian Immigration podcast.com and you can access this you know is IELTS really better than the cell pip test is Canada Border Service Agency above the law <laughs> and then this one self-employed okay and really it's as much about business immigration <coughs> but you can see it's all about um, excuse me Canadian business immigration and I have a two-part series with immigration lawyer excuse me Jeffrey Lowe so go here and check this out because there's a lot of helpful information I've got Eaton on there. There's a lot of helpful information that can guide you um, every bit as much as what you're watching here um, in the video. And if you're someone who has to commute a lot, you've got to travel to different places, it actually makes sense for you to be able to listen to my podcast and get a lot of really good information um, uh, when, you're, when you're traveling. 
So it allows people to multitask, which I really like. Okay, let's see who else we've got here. So the short answer, Eaton, is yeah, book a consult. I can help and we can we can work through the process. Okay. Uh, Sujata says, hey, Mark, how long will uh, D wait before a COPR? Um, I don't know what that means. <laughs> okay, let's see. Um, okay, now this one, I'm going to post it and then I'm going to hit this little right here. I'm going to post that and then I'm going to hit this. Okay, so I won't even go through this, but basically this question here is something that would require legal advice. So um, Arun, um, if you are asking specific questions that relate just to you, that really fits into the category of what I would call um, legal advice. And remember, when I'm going through all of these, I'm providing information, I'm providing answers to, to questions about immigration, but when it comes to specific aspects of your unique situation, then that's where you really need to book a consult. And I can totally help you, but I need to understand all the facts before I can give you direct advice that you're going to then rely on and go forward. So remember, this is disclaimer. Everything that I talk about in these videos is not legal advice, but instead immigration information. Okay. Uh, okay, so we've got a question here looking at um Masi is asking, hey, now they're saying that they will send uh, an e-authorization for expired COPRs and PRVs. When they will send that, please answer me. Masi, I have no clue, my friend. I have no clue how long it will actually take to do that. But I suspect that they're not going to drag it out a long time. If they announce something like this, it means they're in a position to actually do something about it. So it was just announced yesterday. The moment I get a feel for it with all of my clients, how soon they can travel, then I will definitely report on it. And hey, you guys, you report on it too. Go to the Express Entry Law Private Facebook group. And I'm going to flip over here and we're going to take a look at this and I'll show you this one as well. For those of you who are watching on YouTube, there are some advantages to Facebook. And um, I'll flip over here. This is my own private Facebook page. But if you go to the Express Entry Law Private Facebook group, in here, you will have the ability to answer questions and this is one of the main topics that are there. And actually, I could give a shout out to my Express Entry DIY course. Guys, I've opened up, if you go to here and you click on the link, it's the announcement section of the Express Entry Law Group. Um, I've got a link where you can access free the first two uh, modules of my Express Entry DIY guide. So if you go here and then you click on see the courses, you'll see that you can try it for free. And those first two modules I've released and I want to make it um, and they really help people to understand how the express entry works, whether they're eligible, whether they should proceed or not. They help you understand how the criteria works. And it's really, really valuable, these first two, because to a large extent, these are the questions that people search for hours and hours trying to find answers before they're actually able to determine whether or not they should proceed forward with express entry or whether or not their chances are hopeless. So that I've made free to all of you. Jumping back to here, once again, on the Express Entry Law Private Facebook page, this private group here, you have to ask to be admitted. There's three people here that want to join. So if I go here, if you answer the questions, there's more than just these. And if you answer them all, then I will admit you. If you don't answer them all, especially do you agree to abide by the group, then I decline you. If you, no response, decline. Patience here, no response, decline. If you can't take the the um, the time to answer the questions, then I don't let you in. So you guys saw what just happened there. I don't let anyone in who just wants to, to, to join the group. You actually have to answer those questions. And in here, there's been a lot of discussion. And obviously, this live video is being shown in here as well. But there's a lot of discussion about these changes. And you can see they're already posting it in the group. And then lots of people are having lots of discussions. And I, I actually, Igor went in and confirmed with these people that I would be discussing it today in the live Q&A. So, um, so there we go. So I don't know exactly when they're going to start doing it, but let's post in that group. Share your insight. That's why that group that's over 124,000 people, it would probably be 300,000 in all honesty. But for the last almost three years, Facebook won't let it get any larger. <laughs> Don't ask me why, and I don't care anymore. I'm just going to focus on YouTube, where they actually support businesses. Okay, let's see here. 
Okay. Uh, Vivi says, hey, Mark, it's the IRCC office closed. Uh, is the IRCC office closed or not fully running due to COVID-19? The answer is, in many cases, most offices are open, but they're definitely not running normally because of COVID-19. I applied back in late February for spousal sponsorship and still have not received any notification. The reason for that is because paper-based applications truly are not moving forward. The officers have had to abide by the provincial and the Canadian social distancing requirements, and so have they in other countries. And because of that, the same officers who are usually in those offices receiving and processing the paper-based, um, the, those paper-based applications are, are not able to do that and have not been able to do that. Canada, the government has instituted some special teams to, to go in and actually start scanning these applications in. But your situation, uh, Vivi, is, is completely locked up. It's not going anywhere. So don't waste time. You've indicated here that you've, um, as I scroll down here, you've indicated that you've sent multiple um, web forms. Understand every single person is in this boat and nothing is moving forward because of the coronavirus. So you're just going to have to hunker down and just wait, my friend. Okay. Um, yeah, and this is on, I'll just bring this up for Veronica. She, she's complaining about how the problem is that IRCC does not provide uh, responses following the submission of the web form. And that's right. This is for applicants who had their COPR approved prior to March 18th and are now expired. Okay, well, understand these responses, if you just submitted it yesterday, that's the only time that you could have submitted this, okay? When you notify them that your, your COPR is going to expire and you want to proceed forward, they're just going to hold it. There's no notification that they've even received that. So you have your own record that you submitted it. That's good. Then after the fact, because there's so many people in that situation, they're not going to respond to everyone. But now when you indicate to them that you are now ready to travel based on this travel exemption that they've just announced, now I expect for you to get an actual response from them. But we'll see how it plays out. Remember, it was just yesterday, half a day that it's been in place. All right. Um, Okay, big shout out to Chowdhury. And I've got one, two, three. I'm going to forget some. I've got a bunch of clients right now that were kind of stuck in limbo that received those notifications from the OINP. And I'll be honest, I didn't realize that they were going to do that. And what a wonderful development. So now Chaudhary is saying, hey, Mark, receive that NOI um, under the OINP tech draw. CRS is 474, six months before I lose points for age. Shall I accept the NOI and proceed for OIP or should I wait for FSW to resume? Guess what I'm going to do, guys? <laughs> okay, that means that this is a legal question. Shadri, there's no way I can tell you yes or no without you booking a consult, my friend, so that I can understand your situation. The decision to move forward, the decision is not just a simple matter of what is your CRS. There's a lot of different factors at play. Are you, are you in Canada? Are you outside Canada? Are you, if in Canada, is your work permit expiring? Are there other factors at play here? So I recommend that you go over, book a consult. I've, uh, uh, um, I've, I've showed this right here on our page. Go here to the start here page, search holthylaw.com. So holthylaw.com and it will pull up. Click start here and we will get you set up right away. Okay, shifting back here. We're going to now continue on answering more questions. Okay. Um, okay. And once again, Miriam, same thing. You're asking very, very specific questions about this. So a full-time job, two years and a half, and I work part-time for one year, 15 hours a week. Can I claim points for three years of work experience? We need to dive into that a lot more. It seems like on the surface, you know, you had a full-time job for two years and a half. Okay. Well, then that's two and a half years. So you work part-time for one year. Well, theoretically, if you worked 15 hours, you could claim part-time for that, that full year would equate to six months instead of full year, which bundled together on the surface looks like it's three years. But there's way too many questions I have to be able to tell you, Miriam, it has to be this one again, that, that this is exactly what you do. So you need, to book, you need to book a consult so that we can look at that in detail. And guys, trust me, I'm not just trying to line my pocket with consults. That's not why I do this. I would hate to say to Miriam, go ahead, go submit it. Yep, you've got three years. And this, I see this all the time online. All the time I see people who say, yep, you've got a year and a half. 
You've got 15 hours for the next year, which means that therefore it equates to six months. You're good to go, go file it. But understand, I haven't asked anything about the specific details. You've got a full-time job for two, two years and a half. I worked part-time for one year. Was that the same position? Was it with the same company? You know, what were the exact dates? Because immigration has a tendency to round up by months. Okay, so there's a bunch of, and what does full-time mean? Is full-time over 30 hours or something different? And that's all the questions that I'm often faced with when people ask me questions specifically and I have to give legal advice and I can't do that here. So I hope you understand, Miriam. Okay, um, Norel says, any idea when countries other than the U.S. will be exempt from traveling restrictions to Canada? Understand that certain things, we do have orders in council outside of the U.S., um, for, for, for other countries that also have exemptions. You just have to fit within the specific exemption, exemption in order to travel. But let's face it, no one coming to holiday in Canada is coming. Whether it's the U.S. or whether it's another country all over the world, you can't just come for a holiday to Canada right now. So that is banned regardless. Okay. Um, is there any chance for 67 points in the simp with knock 0013? Once again, that tends to be a more legal question um, but I can tell you 67 points is probably unlikely. We've seen that it's at 70 at a minimum, probably 71 or higher. Why? And we're talking about the Saskatchewan Immigrant Nominee Program because those of you who don't have a job offer in Canada, you can submit an application to Saskatchewan. Um, they have their own little point calculations. But right now, it's almost the situation where you have to have a connection with Saskatchewan in order to be selected. And so the points, 67, very, very unlikely, at least in my opinion. Okay. Um, okay, let's keep going through here. Arthur says, thanks. You bet, Arthur. Okay, I'm, we're actually just about out of time here. I want to jump through a few more, um, and let's see if we can get them directed to the topic. So Bernard says, is it better to stay in the U.S. since I heard that the processing and visa centers are reopening here and the process for someone residing in the U.S. is faster. Thanks. I can't speak to that, Bernard, as to what the U.S. is doing. I'm not a U.S. immigration attorney. All I know is that at this stage, the, the U.S. authorities have shown very little uh, intention of making things easier for people, but only worse. I look at what they've announced um, uh, with respect to work permits and a complete bar on, on work permits in, in a number of categories until the end of the year. I've seen what they've announced for students who are attending classes that have now gone online, that they're looking to, you know, reports that they're looking to, to send them packing and send them home to do it from home. That's not a country that's welcoming as far as I'm concerned. And if there's options in Canada, I would be pursuing them if I was in the U.S. wondering what my future held for PR. But I'm not a U.S. attorney. Okay, um, paper-based PNPs, Paul, any updates? All I can say is that all of mine are all tied up. So all of my PNP paper base are going nowhere. Every two weeks we have calls um, with IRCC and the Consultant Association, the Quebec Lawyers and the CBA, uh, the Canadian Bar Association. I attend on behalf of um, the Canadian Bar Association's uh, immigration lawyers. Um, th in those meetings, they have not yet indicated that they've started processing these. All they've indicated is that they have set up a special team or a pilot to get people in to start scanning the applications. So that's what they've been doing. Okay, let's. I'm going to skip through a bunch because I really want to get to everybody. Um, uh, Daniel says, how much do you charge for a consult? Everything. If you just go to the link, you'll see it's right here. I charge $210, which includes tax. And remember, that's Canadian. I can't believe how many times I see consultants. I can't. I see other other big shop law firms that are that are charging people in U.S. dollars for the legal services. And yeah, two hundred and ten dollars American is a whole lot more than two hundred and ten dollars Canadian. But in that consult, that is that twenty five minutes is devoted specifically to answering your questions. I send a form in advance. I review it, and then during the consult, I give you the answers to your questions, and it's. It's completely focused on helpful information, not me sitting back like this for 15 minutes while you explain your story to me. You send it to me in advance, and then we're ready to hit the pavement right when that starts. So definitely go check it out. I'd love to, uh, well, I'll be honest, I am, I am super busy. The consultations are filling up 
every week so fast. And uh, but I'm always, always doing everything I can to try to make it possible uh, for people to get in um, when they need to get that help. OK, let's see what else we have here. <laughs> Muhammad says, what's your opinion? Next cutoff rate for FSW. I always get this every time we meet. Well, let's go back and let's take a look. I'm going to go into overtime here a little bit for you guys. I don't have anything right after, but I, I'm going to go into overtime. So let's go to the rounds of invitations and let's take a look. This is the best way to see. So when we go into here, we can see the last draw was a CEC only draw right here. And it was 445 points. And I've got some very happy clients because of that. But if we go back to the previous rounds and we look, we can see that the previous one was just provincial nominee class, okay, on the 22nd. And then we go back to the FSW draw July 8th. On that day, which is the only FSW draw they've done to date, they issued 3,900 of these um, nominations. And if we look here, 478 was the total. So my belief is that it's probably going to be slightly lower than 478. It could be 475, but that's kind of the range I'm looking at. If we go back here to the rounds of invitations and we go to the statistics that they post right below, you'll see that as of July 19th, that's when it was. And you'll see here um, the round was July 23rd. You can see here that on July 19th, there were at least, remember, 478 was the last draw. So 478 is in this range here. So if we take maybe a thousand of these, maybe there isn't a thousand that were at 478, 479, 480. I don't know. It's hard to tell. But um, I would say probably we could pull maybe a thousand, maybe that's too many, and then add them to everything above. So 4,347, 148, and then above, really, you pretty much, you know, 500 to 600, you've got 183, and anything above is a PNP only. So if they were to issue an open one and they were to extend it to 3,900, it has to dip more into this range. So if 3,900 is what they're going to issue, we know that some of these CEC candidates that were drawn out in the last one, you know, were probably still with higher scores. They could have been a part of this 471 to 480 group. But I'm thinking if it's open, that it's probably just kind of trying to guess is probably going to be closer to maybe 475. At least that's my feeling. It could go a little bit lower, 473 or even 472. But when we have 4,720 in here, there's probably at least 3,000 in here alone. And that was back on July the 19th. And the next round will be closer to, you know, will be closer to three weeks to four weeks. And more people will be piling in. So I think I'm going to go with 475. <laughs> that was a long, <laughs> I'm sorry, that was a long, oh, and I forgot to pull that off of there. That was a long convoluted answer, but that's kind of where things are at. At least that's my my belief. Okay, and I think this is Paul crying here. I'm pretty sure Paul is crying that that I explained that I'm very lucky <laughs> that I explained several times. <laughs> Hopefully, Paul, I didn't skip your question. If it was specific, I did have to jump through it. Okay, and then Mashi says you're doing an awesome job. Guys, I have so many questions here that it's impossible to keep up. Okay. All right. Moving forward. Um, okay. This is a good question. Alan is having trouble getting his West. No, my friend, you need that West in order to get the points. And unless you have the West number, you're not going to get those education points. So you're not going to get an ITA. If however, for whatever reason you can get enough points, maybe you have a job offer or something like that where you don't even need education. Well, I guess you could go forward with that, but under the Federal Skilled Worker Program, the minimum eligibility criteria, you can't claim those points to meet the 67 point threshold in order to be able to uh, be eligible to get into the pool. So um, yeah, so I think it's, it's doubtful. Hmm. Paul says, is it possible to make a video on PNP paper base? Well, I could, right? I could, absolutely. And maybe, um, maybe that's a course that I'll create. Because that is something that is, it's set. The difference though is every provincial nominee program has a different program. And it made no sense for me to try to create a course 
on these PNPs because they change so frequently and there's so many across the country. But the paper-based AAPR application process, so when you're actually submitting it after you get your nomination, that is something that I could do because it's pretty consistent. Um, okay. Hey, Mark, glad to see you. Can, you, can I claim sibling points with COPR? PR takes ages to be issued. Thank you. Um, with a confirmation of permanent residence, and that's all that the sibling has? No, you have to actually be a permanent resident. Oh, here's a sad situation. Yes, Machi, I understand. Some of us already have our PO funds changed to Canadian because we're supposed to travel a day or two before the Canadian border closed. I know. We're going to get you set up. What do you what do you suggest we do about proof of funds since the exchange rate in my country is fluctuating? Okay, Mashi, I really recommend you book a consult and we go through all of those things because you got a lot of different levels that you have to work through. Okay. Um, okay, we got a bunch of questions here. Um, okay, we've got one from Preet. Our application is paper-based. Should we wait or should we apply online now? Preet, same situation. That's a very specific question that really I'd need to know a whole lot more in order to answer that. Okay, but I will give you one thing, Preet. If I have multiple opportunities, I take them all because nothing is guaranteed. So in my situation, if I have an a, 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 a PNP application that's going to take 20 months and I'm also possibly eligible to go through express entry and I'm in Canada, I will do both. But for you, <laughs> I can't say specifically. Okay, um... Let's see what else we have here. Okay, I'll hit a couple more and then we'll wrap up. Um, okay, if COP holders from the U.S. find it unsafe to travel, can they still apply for extension? Um, you can always indicate the situation and absolutely make your pitch through the web form. So absolutely do that because there are very valid reasons why people just don't feel it to travel. And so you can rely on that, um, but you have to notify them. Okay, let's see here. <laughs> you look five years younger today. I don't know why. Maybe it's because I've got my brand new Rodecaster Pro that I'm going to be using for my podcasting. And I also have my brand new stream deck, which I haven't quite had a chance to set up. I'll pull it back to me. And this stream deck allows me to shift my screens back and forth. And I've got a bunch of cool technology that I've, that I've acquired to help me produce a whole bunch of new content. And I'm also super happy because of this. And I'll show you this one, guys. and and just just really feeling good <laughs> I had a good night's sleep last night and the best of all is that I have a new lawyer that's joining me um, I am so excited to bring her on and to introduce her Susan's gonna be joining me on Tuesday I'm hoping this lawyer will join me on Thursday as a guest uh, of next week where I can announce you know her her joining our firm and, uh, and she has actually been practicing two more years than I have. Super experienced, super awesome, super smart, and just the right mix of caring who really wants to, to um, treat clients like family, which is a mandatory requirement for healthy immigration law. Okay. <laughs> All right. I think we're just about wrapped up here. Um, <laughs> Paul says, thank you. I'm very happy because you picked my question. I am so sorry, and that's a good place to end. I'm so sorry, everyone, if I wasn't able to get to your question. Remember, remember that if you have something that's really specific to you and you need assistance with it, don't just guess. Don't just hope you have the right answer. Take the time to jump over and actually book a consult with me, and I can clarify your issues. I can help you to make sure you're not making simple mistakes. If you have doubt, 
I can resolve them. That's what I do. I'm a Canadian immigration lawyer. And so please reach out. Please take the time to do that because that's why I'm here. And so I apologize if I wasn't able to get to your questions. I know there were so many there. Hopefully it was helpful. Hopefully the, the announcements and the instructions that I've provided with respect to um, being able to travel with an expired COPR is, is beneficial. We'll have a lot more information next Tuesday. And where Susan Wood, my, uh, my awesome, super smart, they all are smart. They're all smarter than I am. Um, uh, my associate lawyer in, uh, in Edmonton, she is going to join. And, um, and this lawyer is actually based in Calgary. And so we've got the whole province of Alberta covered, which is really cool. And uh, anyways, and, and with Mauricia down in the Caribbean and Igor's in Calgary as well. And we're actively expanding. So there we have it. All right. So thank you, Diana. I'm grateful that you found it uh, informative. I want to sign off by just saying thank you. Thank you for being a part of this. Uh, thank you for joining me. Thank you for posting your questions, even though I may not have gotten to them. And thanks for making this the best live immigration Q&A regarding Canadian immigration that exists on the entire internet. <laughs> All right. Take care, guys. This is Mark Holthy, Canadian immigration lawyer, ex-immigration officer. I was a border officer with Canada and before I became a lawyer. And uh, that's kind of what got me into all of this. And I take my experience as a high school teacher before I went to law school. Um, and I use all of that to just to, to basically take advantage of, of my love of teaching. So it's a perfect fit. All right, guys, take care. Thanks again and uh, stay safe.